Well, good afternoon, everybody, um, and welcome to our conversation about racial relations in the United States and Black artistry. My name is Ianthi Marini, and I'm the director of choirs here at the Schwab School of Music, as well as the faculty advisor to the Black Schwab Society. Um, I am so grateful to these three extraordinary panelists that we have here with us today. It's my great honor to introduce all of them to you. Um, today, we have joining us for this conversation, Dr. Rosephany Powell, who is hailed as one of our premier composers of choral music in the United States. She is a conductor and voice teacher at Auburn University and widely sought after clinician and commissioned composer. We have Professor Natalia, Nat oh, I just said it wrong after we talked about no, this. No, you did, that was it, you were right. Natalia, Professor Natalia Tomeskin. She is an award-winning playwright and screenwriter, a staff writer on the show, Dear White People, and a professor of creative writing here at Columbus State University. And we also have Maestro Kellen Gray, assistant conductor of the Charleston Symphony Orchestra, music director of the Charleston Symphony Youth Orchestra, the interim director of orchestras at UNC Charlotte, and also an alumnus of our graduate program in conducting at CSU. Uh, we also have two students who will serve as moderators today, Abriana Fambro, who is an undergraduate cellist, and Jordan Johnson, an undergraduate trombonist, and they are both founding officers of the Black Schwab Society. Welcome and gratitude to all three of you. I would like to um, pass the baton on to Professor Tomeskin, who's going to offer us some context about our history of racial relations in this country. Thank you so much, Dr. Marini, for inviting us. And thanks for um, giving a platform to such an important conversation, especially in this moment that we're living in. Um, I wanted to share a little bit about um, the pride that I have in the Black American experience throughout um, so many trials and tribulations from 1619 to the present. I'm not going to do a survey at <laughs> that time span, but I did want to quickly zero in on um, an area of our Black history that feels really close to me, um, and I've written a few pieces of work about this time, and that's um, 1921 in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, the neighborhood of Greenwood was hailed as the Black Wall Street or the Negro Wall Street um, all over the country, being one of the most financially successful and lucrative places for a Black American to be, uh, boasting multiple hospitals, multiple schools, restaurants, movie theaters, um, you know, all manner of kind of what you would expect of the most lovely and finest community that you could look for in the country right on the other side of the Frisco Railroad tracks from Tulsa proper. Um, and in 1921, May, I believe 26th, it was Memorial Day weekend on a Friday, um, a young man named Dick Rowland, a 14 year old shoeshine boy, went up into a building with an elevator um, to use the restroom. He had to go all the way to the top floor to use the Negro restroom. And the elevator operator was a young white woman. And she, while it was a very crowded elevator, um, indicated that Dick Rowland had molested her in the elevator. And while he was taken to um, the courthouse, a mob did come and um, request that he be kind of dealt with in a different manner. Um, what was different here, because so far this story sounds like so many others, but what was different in this case was that World War II vets, Black World War II vets, went and also met those protesters, those mobsters that wanted Dick Rowland with their weapons and their pride and their sense of uh, righteousness as Americans. And as a result of that show of force, the entire community of Greenwood was decimated in fires and... Um, and, and gunshots. In fact, it was the first time that, <laughs> my kids are knocking on the window, I'm sorry. But this was the first time that biplanes fired on American soil. Um, American fighter planes fired on its own soil um, because the National Guard was called in to deal with the situation. Um, and so this prideful place, this uh, self-made American community was destroyed in the span of 24 hours. And the reason that it means a lot to me is because it reminds me that um, the 
Black American experience did not start in the 1960s with the civil rights movement. Um, and it also reminds me a lot of uh, pride in our experience in this country that we can glean from a lot of different points in our history, despite the fact that we miss a lot of this in our formal education. Um, so I wrote a pilot about this situation and I wrote a, a play about it. And just because I was simply taken by the fact that I was an African-American studies minor and had not even learned the story in school once. Um, and it was important to me to make sure that I wasn't just telling fictional black stories, but actual black stories, because unfortunately they've been ripped from, um, literally ripped from newspapers from the times in which they happen and a lot of times covered up culturally as well. So thank you for allowing me to share that piece of our history to start the conversation today. Well, thank you, Professor Temeskin. Um, I agree with the fact that a lot of us were never taught about this history in school and that either we think that we, our history starts in the civil rights movement or the time that we were enslaved. So it's just so interesting to hear about these stories and very important for them to be shared. So thank you so much for enlightening us all with that information. Thank all right, you. so we're gonna start our questions, uh, question portion of this. And the first question I believe will be answered by Kellen first, Maestro Gray. As a black professional, how have you shifted your everyday mindset to prepare for your career? Oh gosh, um, you know, I would say my mindset's probably, there's been a direct correlation between my mindset uh, as a black musician and a black conductor and the exact correlation with my mindset as a black citizen in this country. I mean, all the obstacles that I basically face uh, in the classical music field are outgrowths of the obstacles that you face in society basically. Um, you know, early on in my career, I felt it was necessary to basically code switch all the time uh, to basically survive, you know, to, to maintain credibility, to maintain uh, a certain level of seriousness, uh, or, or there's certain level of seriousness would be uh, considered towards me to maintain employability and hireability. But now I actually feel, especially as of the last couple years, feel a real responsibility to be as much of myself as possible. Um, you know, not only because there's another generation of black musicians to follow me, but also because I think one of the, the main problems is that we don't necessarily feel a sense of autonomy or freedom being in such a tide of, um, you know, having to wade through a tide of, of uh, individuals or institutions that want to either use your blackness or not use it uh, in very strategic ways. And I think, you know, being a, a black artist or a black anything within a um, within an industry that in which you're underrepresented is to constantly sort of being waded through that tide of being pushed or pulled in one direction and understanding like where you are, where you want to be. Like our recently deceased bright star, um, Chadwick Boseman, I think in an interview said, um, if you know who you are, you know who you are not. And then I think that the experience is so often is people wanting you to be something. Uh, and it's so difficult to sort of either stand firm or to route to where you really want to go. And I think honestly, knowing who you are and being strong in your identity is really one of the, the main anchoring forces that you can have in that. I, I am in agreement with Maestro Gray in that um, when I began this journey, it, it was the same sort of thing. As a, as a child, my parents would always tell me that I was living in two different worlds. So when I was home in the, and in the hood, there was a particular way I talked, a particular way that I thought. But as soon as I stepped out of our community, there was a way that I was to speak and conduct myself in order to do just as Maestro Gray said, to be taken seriously. And this journey for me has been as it is with him in that as, as I mature, uh, I'm more of my genuine self uh, is, is, is what I want to uh, portray. Although I feel like my genuine self has developed out of this person who's operating in two different worlds. And even with, I have two daughters and I am teaching them that 
they will operate in both of these worlds, but ultimately they find themselves and their better selves as they learn to operate in more than one world. And, and, and so I don't see it as something that was a negative for me in this journey. I think being able to operate in, in a world where you're not the majority actually allows you more room to be, um, uh, to, to, to be successful among the majority. And then in time, as I think Professor Gray is saying, as we grow in, in, in building reputations that are strong, we are, we, are, we are able to be more of ourselves because the reputation precedes us and then we're able to have more dialogue and more experiences in sharing what I call my black experience. Uh, when I first started composing, pretty much everything was strongly in the European tradition. And the more people came to know me and I felt like I was able to say to publishers, you know, I'm not changing these chords from the jazz colors or whatever I have in there, but on the front end, I would not have been able to get published had I not made some allowances for what they were asking for because nobody knew who I was. So I, I didn't feel like I was selling out. I, feel like I, I felt like I was making these allowances and able to get in and have a voice. Um, such great points raised. I think if I could add another texture to it. I know as a writer, it feels, um, certainly as I've moved into writing in Hollywood as well, there's um, both a desire to see Black artists make Black art, because if you write something that doesn't feel it's speaking directly to race, there's sort of a question of, well, why? <laughs> you know, like, isn't that what you and it's fine, because in my case, that is what I do. But the other thing that's tough about that is that um, you sometimes encounter what feels like the fetishization of black art and the black body on screen or the black sound or whatever. And that's where it gets really tricky because you're kind of pushed into a situation where you want to represent with integrity mm -hmm. what it is you're trying to express, but you also have to make deals in order to get the platform to get it in front of the people that you want to empower and uplift. And so there's that dance that you must do where you're sort of in some ways having to, I, I wouldn't even use the word compromise, but you have to become really skillful in the way that you maneuver through those situations to preserve the opportunity, but to also preserve like whatever it is you're trying to do with an integrity. I apologize real quick. If I could just jump back and I guess piggyback on two of those points there. I think Dr. Powell really illustrated it so well when she said that, you know, without making some early adaptations, you wouldn't have a platform. I think so often, as Dr. Tomeskin was just saying, or Professor Tomeskin was just saying, that, you know, you're often, as a Black artist, supposed to be making Black art. Um, it, it, it's so funny that I think oftentimes, especially when you're young, those are the only way your opportunities can come. And it's very often that way for conductors, especially for professional conductors. It's like doing uh, Juneteenth programs, MLK programs are often the only programs that you may get. And in fact, they probably want you to program the complete works of all black composers on that one program on two rehearsals. Um, <laughs> and good luck to you when you have to do it. And, um, and I was honestly very bothered by that at the start of my career. But I think another mentor told me there are worse things than being pigeonholed. There's um, not getting the opportunity at all. In fact, doing those opportunities well gives you the ability to say, look, you've given me three of these concerts. Now I want a masterworks of whatever, so on and so forth, because you ought to be able to have the right to show your ability to do all the music or whatever it is. And, you know, the, the full breadth of offerings that's within your field, as opposed to, you know, a continued typecasting. Now, that was a great addition. And to all three of you, excellent points. I feel like it's so interesting to see how um, you guys have kind of made it through or grown in your professional lives dealing with these issues because personally I feel like I'm at the very beginning there's so many things that I feel like I have to either change about myself or try to categorize myself it's like well I can't be too black but I need to be I have to fit in also and it's so weird trying to find the balance of it but 
I mean, according to you, it gets better. So that's what <laughs> that's always good to look forward to. And uh, thank you for sharing that. I think Jordan has the next question. Yes, I have the next question. Thank you, everyone. It was really informative to hear what you guys said. And I think for this next question, some of you guys like touched upon it, but I really want to just like understand. And the question is, can you share any experiences when you're in which your competency was questioned because of your race? Uh, I guess I'll jump in to, I guess, stick with the rotation. You know, um, in thinking about this question, there's honestly been so many times that it's been difficult to, to actually remember them because it almost seems it's a baked in uh, part of the equation. Um, I'll give one, you know, quick illustration that wasn't necessarily so personally harmful, but I think it's, it really illustrates, I guess, the, all the preconceived notions you walk into. Uh, in my first week of a job at a particular organization, there was a person that's affiliated with the organization, not on the staff, but apparent, but saw me in a half a suit, just had my jacket off, making copies, uh, and assumed that I was the copy repair guy and, uh, and not actually the new assistant conductor. Um, despite seeing me throughout the office like the whole week, uh, just the assumption that, I, that the way I look, whether it's because I'm young, black, who knows, maybe it was the color of my suit, uh, that I couldn't actually be on staff there. Um, and there's so many little instances and microaggressions that come that way uh, when it comes to, I guess, working in the classical music field. But I honestly don't necessarily get such targeted uh, attacks when it comes to that as a conductor now because the position comes with a uh, default amount of authority. So, you know, musicians are going to see you as a future employer. Uh, you know, administrators are going to see you as a future colleague or have already an existing colleague. So there's, I'm empowered a little bit more than I was when I was a violinist. Whereas when I was a violinist playing in the orchestra, it was pretty much assumed that I wasn't good if I was a black violinist. And I think that's been one of the, the toughest stigmas to get over is the assumption that quality is less than uh, because of your color. And that's not as your color as an inherent thing, but uh, maybe your, uh, how do I say this? level of training, the resources that you had, there's just an assumption that you're not going to be as good because of the way you look, if that answers your question. Yeah, I'll jump in too. Um, I think what I've observed as a playwright in particular is a little more subliminal uh, shade <laughs> against the quality of my work, which usually manifests like this. We love this play, but the reason we can't do it is because we don't know if we have the audience to buy the tickets to fill the seats for this play. And they'll say things like, oh, it, it's because your name is not like a name that people know. Or sometimes they'll just come out and say, I don't know that we have the black base of audience to come out and watch your black play. Um, and that's really tough to hear for a few reasons. It's first of all, it's very disheartening for someone to compliment and then say no, because it's to me, that's BS. Um, because if you really believe in the work, then let's make it work. Uh, secondly, the issue of only black people can enjoy black art. I'm lost with that one as well. First and foremost, if you don't know if you have the black audience, especially if you're in a city like Columbus, that's like half African American population, then that's your problem because they're definitely here and there must be a disconnect between why they don't feel like they can come into your theater. Maybe it's because you don't do black plays ever, <laughs> perhaps, right? Um, but then there's also just the issue of like, why are you not prioritizing diversifying uh, what you're offering not just on February for the, uh, that slot, but just because it matters for representation to learn and see and observe and enjoy the experiences of people that may be not quite exactly the way that we are. And then you ultimately discover that there's so much in common that this was weird, that we even had to go through this exercise, right? Um, but that's tough because then you feel challenged at that point, well, what do I have to do to get my play in the theater? Or what do I have to do to compromise my composition or whatever it is that you're creating? And that's a bad place to be in because the next thing you know, you're really trying to cater to like some ubiquitous, like strange white supremacist power system and no longer responding to whatever the impetus was for you to create anything in the first place. Um, but it's very tempting to go down that road. 
I, I can relate to what uh, both of the other panelists stated, and I would add that uh, as it relates to uh, what I do, um, well, two things, two experiences come to mind. And the first is how, um, for instance, when I go, when I go out to conduct or to work with a group, so often, you know, when I'm in the midst of other conductors or uh, composers, I will, the, the guests or, or those who are hosting, um, you know, they will originally, initially call me Miss Powell. And yet they will call other females and other uh, white male conductors, they will call them doctor, whatever their names are, whether they're doctor or not. And even though it'll be in my bio, they'll call me Miss Powell. And, and so the assumption is that I couldn't possibly be, have a, a, have a doctoral degree. And the assumption is made, I must be Miss, where the assumption with those who don't have the doctoral degree, they must be doctors because they're uh, at this particular level. So, you know, even though it might, might not directly be speaking about my competence, competency, it, in a way it is because it's saying, well, you can't be, so I must assume since I don't know you, but you must be Miss, where, which those of other races, it's assumed if I, if I don't know, I'm going to for initially assume you must be doctor. And another thing that happened with me was, um, uh, my first successful work, the word was God. Uh, uh, I, I wasn't well known. And so uh, when people first uh, listed my works and described, and, and described the work, they called it an anthem or a motet. And then as um, I uh, had several other works published, people started calling these same works gospel, the same work, the word was God, gospel or spiritual. Now there's nothing gospel or spiritual like in this particular the word was God is acapella. Uh, it has um, um, uh, intertwining voices, um, you know, soft polyphony uh, like sections, uh, and and form wise there's nothing gospel uh, uh, or or spiritual like. But as long as they didn't know I was black they felt like I had to be somewhat, whether it was East European or, or some, some aspect of non-Black. And then as soon as they saw that I was Black, the piece was then um, reduced in their minds to what had to be gospel because Black people only compose gospel or arrange spirituals. So uh, those are the types of uh, experiences. As a matter of fact, the word was God, which again is a uh, an acapella motet, won the McDonald's Gospel Fest one year, which I thought was the strangest thing on the face of the earth. How does a motet in the classical European tradition uh, win the Gospel Fest? I assumed evidently the judges nor the choir director directing the choir really understood what gospel was. And I'll leave it at that. <laughs> That's good. Thank you so much for um, sharing that experience. When I um, first like thought of the question, I just thought about like past experiences, but it seems like with everything you said that this can still continues to happen. Can you guys agree with that? With me, it, I, yes. I know it definitely continues, yes. Yes, it definitely continues to happen. You know. Again, with me being a conductor and being surrounded by musicians, I'm obviously in charge when I'm on the podium. So there's a certain level of, again, respect and uh, autonomy that you're allowed. But I find it's really frequent when it comes to the music that's composed, and particularly when I want to program Black composers. And I think this speaks to more of what Professor Temeskin was saying. It's really unusual to me to notice that um, Black art is much more programmed when it's done by a white composer as opposed to when it's done by a black composer. You look at the popularity of Porgy and Bess. Um, when Gershwin is writing this, he's at the same time in Charleston with Edmund Thornton Jenkins, whom he actually 
partially took that style from, who was a composer born in Charleston, who couldn't get a concert basically in Charleston of the U.S. because he was black, had to go to Europe uh, to get concerts, win awards, come back, still can't get works by, and which, I'm sorry, I'm going to go on a whole like uh, soapbox with this because uh, I'm studying both those works right now. Um, and to actually see references in Edmund Thornton Jenkins' work that definitely were used by Gershwin, we'll just put it that way, um, many, many years later that get a lot more credit. And you just, you, you have to struggle to, uh, to, to fight for the validity and the, uh, and the merit of these works by black composers when it's clearly of, 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 of warrant, but it just may not be what sells tickets uh, so often. Experiences is that single you out uh, within your career, within your field, just for being black. I know that um, uh, Maestro Gay, you mentioned Chadwick Boseman, and something that was interesting to me that I found out was that, well, we all know the success of Black Panther, and it was an incredibly successful Marvel movie, but it had predominantly black cast. And just the fact that it was as monstrously popular as it was just speaks to the fact that black stories are universal stories like we are universal people we are not just people that are in our own corner of the world or everywhere and our stories should be shared with everyone so thank you guys for all kind of saying that uh, our third question i'd like to post to you is have there been any times where you were the only black person in a professional setting and if so, share how you felt and if you were mistreated. Gosh, working in the field of classical music where, you know, black people basically make up less than I want to say, at least in the orchestral setting, we make up less than 1% of the actual players and conductors. I think on mass, um, it's something in the, in the classical music world is less than 3% or something like that. Um, so often, Am I the, the only black employee or only person within the orchestra I'm guest conducting or whatnot? In my present position, I'm the only uh, black staff uh, person with the present organization I'm in. And luckily I'm treated very well there. Um, but you know, I think the experience I might be able to speak to with that is actually less to do with how uncomfortable I've been in predominantly white uh, situations, but how comfortable I've been in not noticing uh, well, let me put it to you this way, sorry. Uh, the first time I participated in an all black music festival and I played in an orchestra that was all black, I noticed how comfortable and how at home I felt immediately. And I didn't realize how uncomfortable I was all the time until I got to that setting. And it wasn't until that moment that I realized I was code switching almost 100% of the time uh, when I was at work. For, I mean, everything you can think of, and it's not any different than the way you have to navigate society where can't wear this because there'll be some assumption about me. I can't look like this. I can't be heard seeing this. It was the same thing. I would never go to rehearsal without being in like dress shoes, slacks, and some sort of way that looks professional. I would use a whole different set of diction. Um, and of course, all that changed immediately. As soon as I went and I was at All Black uh, Music Festival, it was just like I was at home. My family reunion with my cousins. We addressed each, all, each other the same way as if I was with my family. And I realized, like, why am I not like this all of the time? I'm basically not being myself at all. Um, and so I think that's just the, the, the biggest principle I can speak to of it is that it's so, um, the not being yourself and a not being, uh, as you spoke to earlier, not being a person just in, the, not having the same level of comfort that everyone should be able to have, being so ubiquitous and being so, uh, so, um, so much of one, the total experience of being in the field is just, it's, it's a shame that it's that way. Um, and I think that may be the, the closest principle I can speak to it. Yes, um, the experience of being in a group of a lot of um, Black folks when you're creating is a lovely experience. <laughs> I, I don't think I've quite been in that situation of being the only one. Um, outside of being the only tenure track faculty in the English department that's Black, which is pretty unfortunate, <laughs> but it, that's the truth. Uh, but thankfully, creatively, because I 
like to write black stories, you'll always have your black actors with you there too. Um, something that we in the theater community wonder about, and I'd love to hear if this is something that you can transpose to your fields, respective fields, but there's always a little bit of that sticky feeling um, when you've written what feels like a very culturally specific play and you have a white director or a director that's outside of that culture. Um, and I've definitely had a lot of white directors do, direct my plays about black life and it's never been an outright issue per se but there's definitely those moments <laughs> I remember in one particular production that uh, the director would ask me like I don't know how else to communicate but I want to start on time <laughs> like can you help me talk to the cast and I'm just like no, I think if they're showing up at 6.15, <laughs> that's what time we're starting. And then I guess we have an hour and 45 minutes. I don't know what to tell you. Like, this is your cast. And I'm not about to sit here and translate CPT issues <laughs> for this group of people. And, you know, but it's tough because I believe CPT is a thing culturally that happens when you feel that comfortable. And... I didn't want to rob my cast of the experience of being able to casually walk into rehearsal and chit chat and take their time because that matters too. Um, I think black people, we need to reclaim like needing space and time to rest, to stroll, to chit chat, to get ready, to get ourselves together and to, to take our time. Um, but so those small, small things have come up for me and they're kind of amusing in retrospect, but can be tough. I can relate to that uh, as well. <laughs> CPT time, yes, it's real. <laughs> and it's beautiful when you can be in, the, in that experience. Um, however, you know, for me, most of the time uh, when I go out, I am the only black, uh, especially if I'm conducting all state choruses or honor choruses or working with professional choirs, where in, um, you know, they're br bringing me in as the black uh, composer or conductor. And it, it, I've, I've gotten used to being in that atmosphere where uh, it's like Maestro Gray said, after a while, you know, you forget you're the only black uh, in the room unless something odd occurs. And, and normally uh, it's some some aspect of the conductor or someone feeling uncomfortable about asking you a question about uh, a, a technique that needs to be employed uh, uh, for which they are uncomfortable because it's from the black experience. Um, you know, I forgot what my other thought was as it relates to that. Um, yeah, and, and again, uh, relating to the fact that my husband and I are the Af the only African Americans in the music department at uh, Auburn University. Uh, it, it, it is a challenge being the only ones and uh, having your voice heard. And when that voice is heard for there not to be certain connotations that because as a black person, you said it, you're either angry or we, it's, it's hard to, um, there's a challenge to at times expressing a differing uh, opinion that's not always assumed that the differing opinion is because you're black, uh, not because it might be the best uh, or a different perspective for the situation. So, you know, when we're, when we're on the front end of coming to Auburn, I didn't do a lot of talking uh, in, in faculty meetings because it was apparent when we came that a, a, a great number of the faculty that were there, which we heard from uh, a faculty member, was that uh, we were not Auburn caliber. Now, since we already had, um, had strong reputations, we understood the statement, we were not Auburn caliber. And the joke was that there had not been an African American there to get tenure. As a matter of fact, the joke was that the last person who applied did not stay long enough to apply. I mean, the pers last person who was hired, I, th I think it was a violinist, did not stay long enough to even apply for tenure. So uh, for some who were there who thought we shouldn't be here, um, they didn't speak to us. 
Uh, it was like we weren't even in the building. They, they totally ignored us. And so our thought was they didn't bring us here and, and, and so they don't, they don't determine when we leave because it was the chair who um, knew of our reputations because he was in the uh, choral vocal area who brought us in to actually make some changes. And so it, it was the, the first three years until we got tenure, it was, it was very lonely. It was just the two of us. And, um, and don't get me wrong, there were some faculty who were supportive, supported, but they were junior faculty and they were, they were new as well. But you, 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 learn how, um, you learn how to find strength in yourself and that's the thing that I, I think I, I, I like to share with students and those uh, when I go out. I, I think that um, challenges actually grow us in character. And I feel like with every challenge, um, I composed a song called Still I Rise based on Maya Angelou's poem. And for every challenge, the challenge isn't meant to make me less, the challenge is to raise me up and make me stronger. And so I don't look at every challenge from without to be something that is horribly against me. For every one that I make it through, what may have been meant to hurt me has actually been a blessing to me because every time I endure and rise, I am better and stronger for having gone through it. So as an African-American, I always in, in, encourage other African-Americans, don't see it always as a battle meant to destroy you. It doesn't really matter if they mean for it to destroy you. If you persevere and come through it, what they meant to happen to you, it actually have turned around to be the total opposite. And then they can't figure out why you keep ascending, why you keep growing, why you keep pressing on. It's because for everything you've been through, it prepared you to face whatever they were putting you through. And so in the end, you win because they can't figure out why is she still here? Why is she still doing this? And then I just move on. I, I, I don't gloat. I just get joy because I know what it did to you. Forgive me for, for going on. Where's the church that. piano? Can we get that uh -huh. sound cue? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but that's that what I awesome. hear both of you saying too. But that's what I hear both of you saying. Mm -hmm. You know, I think we right. as African Americans, I, I refuse, I refuse, and I tell uh, the students that when I go out and, you know, they're the only Blacks in the choir, it, they're, they're, they're happy that I'm there, and I'm sure it's the same with you, they're happy, because they see someone who looks like them, and they tell me their stories, and I always say, you're not a victim, you are, you're here. So, so, so though you feel uncomfortable, you're going to be of excellence, you already are of excellence, so get used to it. Hmm. You know? Yes, that's real. Yes. Speak on it, Dr. Powell. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and thank you for saying, like, what you said right at the end that we're not victims. I personally, I needed that because sometimes it can feel, definitely feel that way that we're all going through something. Yeah, that was, that was so uplifting. Like, I'm just thinking about being a viewer just watching this, I'm just like, imagining the feelings, I, can, I really can't describe it, but it's just, that was, that was very powerful. Um, for the next question, so, it seems like you guys have a lot of experiences and we've talked about it. So, um, how have you guys, how has being a black professional changed in the past five years? And how do we, what do you predict will happen in the next five to 10 years? Um, you know, I think actually, if, if you don't mind, I want to reframe my answer just a little bit. Um, I was listening to a uh, talk that Tana Hasi Coates gave not too long ago, and I think he really expressed that the social consciousness of this country, and I think a lot of the, uh, the same with the artistic industries, uh, the push to allow the consciousness to progress happens in windows. The window's not open all the time, but when it is open, you've got to like push through as much as you possibly can and grow the consciousness of the people around you as much as you possibly can, because it won't always be so. Um, and to me, in the last five years, I want to say right now is the time I felt the safest to have these conversations that we're having right now. If you would have asked me 
I mean, it would have to be, how do I say this, like a safe environment for me to speak about a lot of the things that we're talking about right now today. And I don't think it could have been in a formal setting like this. It couldn't have even been uh, even amongst uh, non-Black colleagues, like one-on-one. -on -one. People just weren't ready to talk about this kind of stuff. So I think that's kind of the biggest change I've noticed over the past five years. Um, it's going to be, I imagine, a little difficult for me to project what the next five to 10 years will look like, but I hope it's the inverse of what the previous five to 10 years were. Um, though I do think we're sort of, um, we've overcome certain stigmas that like black bodies aren't suitable for classical music, whether it's performing it, composing it, or have interest in it. I think we're still on the stigmas that we have to lower the quality of our expectations uh, if we're going to diversify our artists and our writers and things like that. I think we still have a a stigma that audiences won't come to see that. Um, I hope that the next couple years will will dismantle some of those stigmas. Um, I do think that much like, sorry, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna bring it this level, but I think that much like there is sort of a, a white lash uh, after so much progress with certain things that that may actually happen in our industries, I would hope not. Um, Cause I think, you know, it, it, as much as you push, there's always gonna be some level of resistance from those who are just deeply rooted and what's going on. So I estimate that in the next couple of years, there's going to be a push and there may be some resistance, but I hope that we can ultimately break through that, at least in my time uh, in this industry. Awesome points, Maestro Gray. And I think if I would add anything, I would say I, I completely agree. That's that this is a moment. This feels like a hot moment. The window is opening right now. People want black stories right now. People are being shamed through Twitter. Uh, studios are having to make claims about what they're gonna be putting on their screens and producing. And whether it's because they really mean it or not, I don't care because I want an opportunity to lift the community up and tell our stories regardless. Uh, but I think that that fear of that repercussion um, of, well, that's too much now, we need to reel it in, is always a fear that I have too. Um, I think one thing I'd love to see happen in this window that we're in, besides it like not closing, um, would be a resurgence of some of the principles of the Black arts movement of the 1960s, of just investing more in our Black arts organizations, rebuilding them, uh, making space for more of them, um, because in those interim periods, we still need a space. and. Um, you know, sometimes you can really feel the absence of how those 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 uh, institutions have been kind of left in the dust as the bigger institutions and the more predominantly white organizations have taken us up in favor. Um, and we neglect to continue to, you know, uh, water and feed those black arts organizations in the meantime. So I'd love to see us thinking about all of the uh, above so that we can continue to thrive without having setbacks in the next five to 10 years. I agree with both of them and have nothing more to add, spot on. Thank you so much. I think, I think that was a very realistic answers that you guys both gave because I think there is no true telling, but there's things that we can truly hope for. And I, I really admire that you um, brought up that there will be pushback because I think like it's very easy to talk about like what we want to do and act like everything's gonna be all right when we do it, which is unrealistic. There's going to be pushback. So now uh, we actually have questions from our live stream audience. So we'll be asking you guys that. Uh, all right, this question is from Kayla Shepard. It says, as an artist, what are some challenges students have to face or navigate after graduating, particularly networking and the racial assumptions, microaggressions, pigeonholed problems, et cetera, that may come with entering the workforce. Most of you have touched on it already, but what are some tips or ways to best handle those challenges? See, I say one of the biggest things that's helped me that I wish I'd known right away coming out of school is to find a mentor that's tread through these waters before. Uh, one of the resources that I didn't have, that I had, that I didn't realize I had was a, a mentor is my old violin teacher before I came to Schwab uh, for my undergrad. Uh, he was, his name was Leroy Sellers. He was a violinist that integrated the Charlotte Symphony in the 60s. And had I, some of the things that I was going through while I was in school 
when I just left school and I was getting into early professional work, had I, it even occurred to me to call him and talk to him um, and think about some and hear his voice on some of the things that he went through, it would have been a huge help. Um, it wasn't until I actually made it to, it progressed some ways and I just go back to visit with him casually that I realized all the things that he went through and gone through and seen. Um, and now I actually, you know, employ that advice and I talk to him quite a lot. Uh, but I wish that I'd used that early on and that would have helped me navigate some of the microaggressions, get, uh, fortify my strength when I just need to press on because some of the stuff you just can't fix it like by yourself, and especially when these like five minute interactions you have with people like one example I'm dealing with right now is uh, I, I consult several orchestras around the country and how to uh, address diversity initiatives and how to program uh, certain concerts and things like that. And there's certain institutional knowledge that you just can't break down in a five minute interaction in an hour long meeting and uh, whatever amount of months that you're going to consult. For example, it might be creating a, a committee for your organization that uh, that creates greater cross cultural competency. You might have a view within that standpoint that this committee should not be a permanent entity. It should be just a temporary thing because inherently we'll, be, we'll become changed as an organization. We'll be much more diverse and we'll be more progressive. And then we don't have to worry about this anymore. No, it's a, this country is going to always continue to progress. The makeup of and demographics of our countries, our schools, our institutions, our constructs of time. And I'm not going to change your mind about that in like five, 10 minutes. That's just not going to happen. Um, and so sometimes you've got to be strong enough to like let some battles go or just push through some things and understand it's you've got bigger things to worry about. And, uh, and I understood that from some of the things that he told me. So if I could give any one real solid piece of advice is find somebody that's navigated before and find your safe spaces to talk about some of these things. Um, that, that's about all I can offer. And I, he, uh, he, he stole one of mine. And, and that, it, no, no, I loved it. Uh, and that is picking your battles being wise enough to know when it's time to battle and when it's time to just learn. Um, there, again, there are things that people will say to you because they're basically nescient, uh, or, or shall I say ignorant. And th they don't always mean you harm. And so, you know, sometimes it's nice to let those things slide. At other times, you can, you can come to understand this is a time to, to educate. But I think, and, and maybe a ment having a mentor would assist with that, but, but just knowing when it's time to address something and when not in order for you to get what you need out of it. So sometimes you addressing something is really removing you from the ability to even continue or, or to move forward in what you want to get accomplished. And that to me is not, I, 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 that's not an Uncle Tom. I speak to students all the time. You don't say exactly what you feel at the moment. You feel it all the time. There are times where you have to choose to just zip your lip and understand that there may be a battle in the future, but for right now, for me to get what I need to get, I need to uh, just kind of say, I'm going to learn from this one and understand that there are people like this who, as, as um, Maestro Gray was saying, sometimes people aren't going to get it. And, and so, you know, you just may have to let things slide at that moment. So, you, you know, just being wise enough to know when to, when to address something and when not to address it, which one's going to get you what you need to progress. That makes a lot of sense. And I think... Um the length of your career, I'm only in my 30s, but I still am amazed at how much longer I'm doing this than I thought was going to, I mean, I assumed I would be doing it for a long time, but it feels longer than you think. And so you want to try to think long term and be savvy, be, you know, strategic. I totally agree with that. Um, I also feel that, uh, you know, coming out of school, you might be working some weird job. You might be doing something that feels like totally not what you went to school to do. And I would just encourage you again, think it's a long, it's a long road. It's a, it's a long game. Continue to hone your craft, continue to make art whenever, wherever possible in ways that people maybe have not done before, but that feel right and of the moment, just go for it and do it. Um, 
because you're you're honing your craft but you're also doing what you love i think too often we put ask yourself this is something that, that uh, i was asked in grad school by one of the faculty all of us were in a class he said some of y'all are not going to actually be dramatic writers after you you grow up or get out of this program some of y'all just went into debt for this degree and you're not actually going to do this i want you to let that sink in now if that really bothered you <laughs> and you thought not me then i want you to answer for yourself well what does success look like then what does it mean to be a dramatic writer for me then? And I remember having to tell myself, well, I'd love for it to mean that I want a Tony or a Pulitzer Prize, but if it means that I at least get to share the work that I'm doing with other people, even if it's just 20 people once a year, that's success for me too. Answer that for yourself so that you don't get defeated in those early years and you can you know, have the stamina to push through that stuff. Thank you so much for these answers. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm truly at a loss of words for just like how much knowledge that I'm personally receiving, but then how much knowledge everyone else is receiving. And I think it's so great that we're having this conversation. I'm so thankful. And um, just to end things on like a nice note for like people to just like really do things like now, um, do, who's doing big right now in your respective industries? Uh, so who's doing uh, big things in our respective industries? Like, uh, for my example, like who's who's a, a big black conductor right now, or uh, or in the classical music industry? Uh, yeah. I'm really blessed to have, in my first job, come from an orchestra in a really diverse city and in, with an orchestra that directly addressed um, diversity, equity, inclusion in classical music. So I'm lucky enough to have, be friends with a lot of these folks, like uh, Roderick Cox, who's a former. Uh, actually another CSU alum. Uh, he's actually was a former associate conductor of the Minnesota Orchestra, is now living in Berlin and guest conducting a lot. There's a Charleston native, good friend of mine, Jonathan Hayward, another young black conductor right, uh, right now based in uh, England. Um, a good friend, Jonathan Rush, who is coming out of grad school and making a lot of noise right now um, and getting a lot of attention. Um, who else? You know, some of these people actually, they're, uh, how do I say this? I know you asked me about people right now, but for me and what I do as conductors, it's sort of a lost generation that I think we don't know about. And I love to point them out like right now, like Paul Freeman, who was a founder of Chicago Sinfonietta, Dean Dixon, great book about him, uh, Negro at Home, Maestro Abroad, check out that book. Uh, because this is sort of the, the generation of conductors in which shoulders I stand. Um, and I think that none of us that are sort of making noise right now would be able to without them. Um, so I would highly encourage you to not just seek out those of us who are presently working, but seek out the generation that came just before us as well. Well, I won't, I won't call names, but I think what I am uh, excited about is um, at the university level, the number of African American choral conductors, uh, that number is really increasing. Um, I could call out some institutions and some names, but I would hate to miss some names. But whereas back in the past, there may have been maybe, you know, just a handful of us at universities who are African -American, Americans uh, leading the way, working with graduate students, con uh, conducting and holding uh, directorships or assistant directors at major universities. Uh, the number of, of African Americans getting these doctoral degrees and becoming conductors has within the last, and, and that is a major accomplishment within the last five years, has uh, grown exponentially. But there were so few of us that uh, uh, this, this, this number still leaves us woefully in that 3% or less, where before it was like 0.5%. Or so, so we. I, I'm really excited uh, about um, the number of African Americans who are deciding to pursue uh, the term, the um, the doctoral degree, and then go into university teaching. In my field, I want to highlight three names of um, playwrights that have crossed over into the film and TV world as well. That are great in both spaces. Um, Terrell Alvin McCraney is one of my favorite playwrights. The Brother Sister Trilogy is one that I used to teach at script analysis class over at uh, One Hour Time. He was the screenwriter on Moonlight, the uh, Oscar winning film. 
and he's currently the um, creator and showrunner of David Makes Man, which is a new own series, um, like many of his other plays, slightly biographical piece about a, a coming of age story about a gay uh, student dancer in Liberty City, Miami, um, kind of moving through his community and finding his identity there. Um, I also love uh, Katori Hall. Katori Hall is a um, playwright famous for The Mountaintop, probably more than any of her other plays, which was an examination of the night before MLK was assassinated at the Lorraine Motel. It's a so, sort of a two-hander play between he and the housekeeping uh, lady for the hotel um, that evening and the things he was brewing and thinking of. And her play Pussy Valley was recently made into Pea Valley which is on stars right now and I haven't gotten stars yet but it's got great reviews and people are loving it on Twitter um, and finally Justin Simeon who is the creator of Dear White People and my former boss when I was working on the show um, Dear White People season four will be out sometime in 2021 coronavirus is holding up the process a little bit but we're supposed to go into pre-production next week so maybe they're going to be able to shoot this fall and his movie, Bad Hair, which was at Sundance in uh, January of this year, will be having its um, widespread debut on Hulu. And it's a story about a possessed weave that has <laughs> taken over from this black salon. And it's kind of a funny horror thing, but it's also a meditation on black women's standards of beauty and the ways that the lengths to which we will sometimes go to try to fit a part. Uh, the society is asking us to play. In addition to hearing like all the people that you guys are watching out for, all the people that inspire you, I believe that you all inspire us. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, especially as two Black musicians and speaking for um, other, I guess, Black students everywhere, that it's nice to see that we are out there. We're out there. And especially starting us getting started on this organization, look to people, look to people like you and call upon you to share your experiences with us and lead us in a lot of ways so that we can all grow together. So again, just thank you guys so much for being here and being able and sharing your wisdom and experience. It's just, it's really valuable. Yes, thank, thank you, you for so having much. us. Like, this has been a very great experience. Like, I'm so happy thank that you. thank Dr. Marini, um, Dr. Hansen, Dr. McCabe, um, Jelani, he's working back in behind the scenes. Uh, everyone that's um, been able to help put this together because while we're in the face, we're not alone, and we definitely are very grateful for everyone who's helping us. Yeah, I just, I'll just piggyback on that and thank you, Dr. Powell, Professor Temeskin, Maestro Gray. You have given us so much to think about, um, to sort of process in the days to come. I know that once this is sort of in a recorded podcast form, I will go back and watch it many times to catch everything that you said again. Um, just thank you for sharing your time and your expertise, but also your amazing spirit and uh, your honesty and truth with us. Uh, just, just thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm totally speechless with, with everything that I learned from you. And thank you for blessing our spirits and hearts today. Thank you. Thank you for having thank us. Thank you so yes. much. My pleasure. Yes, does anyone have any closing remarks before we end? You know, I would just uh, encourage everybody to stay encouraged. You know, um, I, you know, safe spaces have been a new thing for me. And if those, uh, and for Black people out there who haven't found a safe space to basically vent, to empower, to learn, uh, I would, I would highly recommend you find one. Understand that the problems that we face today are not, they're not necessarily your problems, they're not problems you created, um, but you know, they are problems that negatively affect your life. So despite the fact you were taking on the responsibility to helping fix them, um, know that you know these aren't things that you shouldn't carry any extra burden uh, other than the fact that you're trying to improve the lives of yourself and the people around you. So, uh, so stay strong, uh, stay connected, but also stay socially distanced these days. So, um, <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> Well, I, I think that's our time, everybody. So thank you again um, so much to all of you. Thank you, Dr. Hansen, Dr. McCabe. And um, 
I look forward to this conversation just continuing that this is this is really just the start of this conversation. So thank you, the three of you so, so very much for giving us your time this afternoon and stay Great. safe. You thank too. You. Thanks, you too. Thanks all. Bye. Thank you. Bye.